Hello and welcome to UChicago's Alumni Association's Career Month webinar. My name is Linda Pantel and I work with the Alumni Career Development Team here at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. Career Month in November is when we are bringing you a month of free online career programming tailored for UChicago alumni of all degree types, years, industries, and backgrounds. Each program is an opportunity to learn from successful Maroons who are leading at the top of their fields. I'm delighted you to welcome to our, to our webinar entitled, How to Work with Recruiting Firms. Today's speaker is John Ryan, AB89. He's a global practice leader for power, renewable energy, and clean tech, and US Regional Vice President for TransSearch International. It's my pleasure to hand the controls over to John. Well, hello everybody, uh, and hello uh, and shout out to my fellow Maroons. As uh, Linda mentioned, I uh, went to the University of Chicago and got my AB in linguistics. Um, I have been in executive search and the recruiting industry in general for 29 years since undergrad. So in the next hour, I will be sharing um, some, some advice, helpful hints, and uh, maybe some trade secrets in terms of how search firms work with individuals. So let me start by doing this. Um, I, I have, a, I have some slides that I'll go through, and I'm going to use these slides really more to illustrate, uh, to really illustrate how I think and how people who are in executive search think. But before I do that, let me start with one sort of quick background piece. So if you've never worked with any kind of recruiting company before, uh, let me explain. There are two basic kinds. There are retained executive search firms and there are recruiting companies or recruiting agencies. So the, the, the distinction there really is that executive search firms will typically handle um, C-level and VP-level positions in companies and uh, contingent uh, recruiting companies um, will work on lower level positions. So what does that really mean? What does that really mean? So if you're tuning in and you're a, a five-year person in your field, um, Positions that you that you might be interested in may be handled by retained or contingent recruiting companies. It could be either. So you may, in fact, want to reach out to both. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind here in terms of the types of companies. Let me talk a little bit a little bit how a little bit though about how retained companies like mine look at folks. So as an example, my company um, was founded in 1982 and it's a global company. We have offices in 35 countries. And we tend to look at, at professionals more from a sector standpoint. So, you know, for example, you know, individuals who are in CPG, consumer retail, or financial services, government, nonprofit, life sciences, or as the case is for me, um, you know, uh, power and renewable energy. Um, so continuing on, you know, we also do uh, get involved in other types of recruiting. So we do get involved in things like interim management, which would be sort of a, uh, a way of describing people who work on work in, uh, on a temporary basis for companies. And we cover a lot of different roles as well. But what I want to do is, is, is I want to talk a little bit about, about what I think you guys need to focus on when you're, when you're interacting with, with uh, recruiting companies of all kinds. So if you're if you're uh, if you're uh, starting to uh, to go out and look look at look for a new role either as a as an experienced or highly experienced business professional you have a lot of resources you have you have campus resources um, you have you have uh, uh, various websites like LinkedIn and Indeed and so forth that you can use and then you have these recruiting companies and so where you might find uh, it helpful to, to, to interact with recruiting companies would be if, for example, you're very specialized by your field. So as, as, as an example, I spend most of my time in the, in the renewable energy power utility space. And then these are, for examples, these are examples of clients of mine. So it, it's very, very specialized. So when I look at, when I look at individuals um, who contact me um, to get on my radar screen, People really contact me because of my expertise in this particular space, not because I happen to be in Chicago so much or not because 
um, I would work with CEOs and CFOs. So I'd say I'd say major tip number one: make sure that you you think about exactly how you want to approach your your search. If you're a, a highly tenured, experienced individual in say fintech and you wish to continue on in fintech, um, what you may want to do is research and focus on uh, individuals with who, who who are in recruiting who only focus on the fintech space. So that would be like looking for a practice leader, um, you know, a practice leader who specifically works in fintech with companies like like PayPal and companies like that. Me myself, I look for individuals like this. I look for individuals who have experience in the power space. So more often than not, people seek me out on that basis and 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 reach out. And so you might you might say for exa for example, how many people are out there like me? Who are this specialized and I would tell you that there are probably a couple hundred <laughs> as shocking as that may be um, so what what um, I would first say is is again think about what your what your plan of attack is if you're if you're going to specialize by industry then focus on recruiting firms and individuals within those firms who are specialized by industry now if you're going to approach something more from a, from a skills or a functional standpoint, let's say for example, you are a human resource professional and you have five, 10 years of experience in HR. So you might be industry agnostic. You might be interested in going into certain industries and you might in fact want to leave your, your current industry. So you know, I have a, a contact who, as an example, wanted to leave retail companies and move more into financial services. So she uh, decided to to go after opportunities in HR with banks and hedge funds and finance companies and so forth. So what she did there was she looked for recruiting companies who specialized in HR. So again, another way to look at that, um, recruiting companies have individuals like myself who specialize by industry or there are people who specialize by job function. And um, I'd say uh, good examples of that would be human resources, financial services, uh, technology, information technology, IT, marketing. Um, those would be some of the sort of the key breakouts. I, I know some people in recruiting who specialize just in supply chain or procurement and things like that as well. So. I, so if you're thinking about my, my comments, there are multiple ways here to approach your search by function, by industry. And then there are other ways to approach your search. Uh, you, can, you can obviously clearly focus on um, a job search on a regional basis. Um, that doesn't necessarily conflict with the other two approaches that I mentioned, but it's something to, to note that you know people like myself, as an example, specialize nationally um, in my space, uh, because you know, for example, Chicago is too small of a market for me to only focus on power, renewable energy, and, and green technology, et cetera. So I'm more national or even international in focus. But if you're looking, for example, for a, you know, say a marketing position in the Chicago area, um, and you are, for example, working in digital companies, you might want to focus uh, regionally by job function and also by, um, you know, uh, by, by sector. But you may want to deploy uh, multiple strategies and then see, see where these things, see where things, things uh, sort of uh, end up in terms of uh, efficacy. So a question you might ask me at this point is, John, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to reach out to some recruiting firms. I've been doing my online research. I've been looking around. Um, you know how how much can I really rely on recruiting firms to really find find my next opportunity? Um, what percentage of, of my of my time should be spent on talking to recruiting firms as opposed to, to my own direct research or applying to jobs online and things like that? So uh, my my answer there, and it's the same advice I would give to, to to friends and family, is have it be one of the legs of the stool. So uh, you know. LinkedIn, as an example, is an effective strategy. Uh, I have friends who work for LinkedIn, and they, they tell me that you know somewhere in the order of 20% of the positions posted on LinkedIn are actually filled um, through LinkedIn. 
but that means that 80% weren't. So um, I would say as a, as a multi-pronged strategy, and I would say that there are three legs to the stool, uh, one leg would be, you know, applying online, LinkedIn, things like that, going to actual company websites, and the third would be recruiting companies. Um, we could add more, more legs and say networking and direct professional networking and things like that as well, which again, you know, you can, you can deploy all those strategies, but it's very clear that a lot of positions are posted online and not all of those positions are handled by recruiting firms. I, I would say, I would say in a general sense that, you know, to some percentage, maybe, maybe 20, 30% of the opportunities that are uh, out there in corporate America are handled by recruiting companies. Um, you know, recruiting companies are, uh, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar space. There are literally thousands of recruiting companies. So those would be the, 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 the strategies that I would deploy. Um, in my own opinion, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not networking with at least, a, uh, I would say eight or nine recruiting companies, you're probably really not getting out there and really getting on their radar screen. Um, if you, for example, um, are in, say, the consumer product space, uh, luxury goods or something like that, what I would do if I were you, in terms of, again, looking at recruiting companies as a target, I would do research uh, into the, some of the, the big players and then the smaller players, and I would try to identify who are uh, practice leaders um, uh, or regional leaders in con the consumer products practice of some of those recruiting companies. Um, so then the, the next question would be, I've identified a name, Tom Jones, um, he is with Stanton Chase and he is in consumer products. Um, his bio online says that he recruits for um, food companies and uh, companies like uh, Rubberware and uh, Culligan and all these other companies that make uh, various uh, consumer products. Great. So what do you do with that? So I would, at that, I would at that point, I would probably just email a, a resume and a cover letter to that individual and, and, and I would maybe have it be the first part of the outreach. Um, you know, uh, recruiting, recruiting folks get a lot of inbound phone calls, so some of them um, will hardly ever pick up the phone if they're real scheduled up and don't really have the time to take uh, inbound calls. So you should, at a minimum, um, email in some information about yourself. So then the question is, what information should I email? So resume, CV, absolutely. Cover letter, yes. Um, well, I like, from a cover letter standpoint, I like for people to be very clear and very direct. So I like for people to, again, to indicate what kind of positions you're interested in. Um, I'd like you to, uh, also cover some things that I, I'll ask you on the phone uh, or during a, an in-person interview, um, which is, um, again, what are you interested in? Um, are you only interested in opportunities um, in your current uh, location or are you open to relocation? If so, where? This is very key in this marketplace. Um, so again, if, you know, using the example of consumer products or, or industrial, for example, um, these opportunities are literally all over the United States as well as abroad. So, um, you know, it, it's very, it, it, it's just a really good idea to be very upfront with recruiting professionals regarding your, your flexibility or the lack thereof with, from, a, from a location standpoint. Um, so those, those are some key things. Uh, I also like, that's not something you'd want to cover necessarily in a, in a, in a cover letter, but if you, if you're, for example, a victim of a merger um, or some sort of industry consolidation, you can note that on there, or you can wait until we have a chat on the phone or uh, an in-person interview. So a person asked me the other day whether they should include compensation information in, um, in a submittal to a recruiting company. So that's an interesting question. Um, if you want, you could always indicate what you're seeking um, from a compensation standpoint. And that's perfectly okay. Um, given some of the recent legislation that we have in the United States, um, recruiting professionals in general are becoming more limited in terms of the kinds of questions we can ask regarding compensation. This is a, 
this is legislation uh, referred to as pay equity. So if you're if you're curious about pay equity, um, the legislation is designed to drive out uh, compensation inequity um, from an applicant standpoint. That's a very fancy way of me of me saying that if I know your compensation, um, I I would have bias regarding the kind of offer you would be made. And the legislation is designed to, again, to kind of drive out the, the bias that you have, mainly due to the fact that women um, are not uh, being paid at, uh, at what I would say the, the same level as men are for, for the same position. As you're looking at this slide as an example, you know, a CEO of a power company, you know, it, it, it is the case, unfortunately, for a number of these roles that women's compensation lags behind men's, and uh, as a result, there there is this inequity. So pay equity is designed to to deal with that. So what I'm telling you is that most recruiting companies should not be asking you what your current compensation is. They should just be asking you um, what compensation you are seeking. So that that's just a, a key thing. So. We are all d doing what we can to kind of screen out, um, screen out inequities. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit here. So, you know, our, you know, I've worked with a, a variety of companies and uh, worked for, for a, a variety of uh, different individuals like Lisa and Steve and Robert Rickenberger and some of these folks. Um, again, from a recruiting company standpoint, we're 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 client driven. So, Sendian or Mitsui or Sun Edison. These companies have hired me um, over the years to handle a specific need, like say a CFO need. So what that what that also means is I'm not applicant driven. So if you apply in to our company for for positions, um, I, I I do not go and market your background uh, to companies. So I am I am not becoming your agent, so to speak, um, as a retained search professional, I am client driven, but it still makes sense for you, the individual, to reach out to folks who are uh, in my roles and for you to share your background with me because you may fit a role that I have, you may, uh, I will put you in our system, in our database, and um, we will keep you in mind for other positions. Um, big companies with 200, 500 consultants, some of the big recruiting firms have a thousand consultants. Um, we we have uh, national and international databases, so we will put you in into our applicant tracking system, and we will keep you in mind for future opportunities. And if you're actively looking, we'll definitely um, prioritize you over people who are passively looking. So what I'm saying there is, you should send things to recruiting professionals. Um, they are not applicant driven; they are client driven, but because of our the volume of work that we handle, um, we more often than not can be helpful and useful um, for your job search. Um, so, a couple other things that people have asked me over the years, and again, I have 29 years of recruiting experience, which seems like a whole lot to me. Um, so, this is something I also want to touch upon as well. So I was just I was just talking to a guy uh, this morning. I was interviewing, and you know he and I have about a, a similar level of work experience. And he said to me, he said, at my experience level, how difficult is it for me to leave my industry and go to into, into another industry? And John, as a recruiting professional who's specialized by industry, um, would you actively consider me for a position in a power company, even though my background is working in the pulp and paper sector? This is a great question. So the answer is, yeah, I, I'm absolutely very open to considering, you know, somebody who wants to make an industry change. And I'm sure that some of the people who are listening in and mulling over some of this stuff, they're wondering, how do I move out of my industry into another industry? So case in point, you might be in an industry that you feel um, is, uh, is not growing. Uh, maybe it's going the wrong way. Or you might, you might feel um, like you're ready for a new change. Um, you may not want to work in the same industry for 30 years. So um, as it turns out, um, this individual, uh, Mike as an example, has 20 years in sales and marketing in the pulp and paper sector. So 
what's interesting is is that he has really good, he has a really good background with a, a very big multinational company. The the issue for him is that his his sector has not been growing, and as a result, he feels that the number of opportunities for him are very limited um, in the United States right now um, because of digitalization and internet and so forth. So as a result, he wants to switch industries. So the answer, the answer to the question, can I switch industries? Absolutely. The, the question then becomes, can recruiting companies facilitate that? Absolutely. How do I message that? I would just simply you know, be very clear that you want to make that kind of change um, and just just be aggressive and go after it. Um, you know, it is the case again. If I'm just sort of talking here uh, very openly about um, sort of how things really work, it is the case that if, for example, if you were in a sales role, uh, say in the pulp and paper sector, and you wish to move into digital or you want to move into uh, in another industrial sector, it may be hard for me to um, to to uh, find you a promotion in, in, in a change like that um, because it's really more of a skills hire as opposed to a, 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 an expertise and industry uh, sort of hire. So as a result, um, you may, you may want to be flexible in terms of compensation. You might want to take more of a lateral uh, and move over. And, and we'll ask you that as well when that, when that comes up. But there are, with, with, certain, with certain positions, um, it's a lot easier to move from one industry to another based on function. So, um, again, if you are in human resources, finance, I would say maybe procurement, um, you know, some sales and marketing roles, I, I think it's generally um, not that difficult to switch industries. Uh, it is also the case that it's probably easier to switch industries when you're 5, 10, or 15 years out than when you're 25, 30, and 35 years out in terms of work experience. Um, it is the case that when companies are hiring you know, people who have, again, 25, 30, 35 years of experience, they really are looking for industry experience. Um, that being said, I can give you countless of examples of people who've had 30 years of experience who have left left one industry and gone to another. So uh, I'm not always right. Uh, I am generalizing, but it, it's also the case that there is a little bit of a of a built-in bias for heavily experienced people um, for it to be more difficult to switch industries. So again, the the topic here is how to work with recruiting companies. And so the key points that I've made are do research. Identify companies based on the type of role or the industry um, or, or, again, location um, based on your interests. So if you're, again, if you're a multi-tenured, multi-year tenured individual with experience in consumer products and you wish to stay in that space, then you would look for um, recruiting, recruiting companies that are active in that space. You would also look for people who are experienced functionally in that space. Um, or if you're looking to make a, a relocation, um, you may want to do a lot of research. So for example, if you're in Chicago, where I am, and you wish to move to Portland, um, you would want to do research into the Portland, Vancouver marketplace. So you would want to get on the radar screen of recruiting uh, professionals in and around the Portland area. Because me in Chicago, I really am, again, being, I'm so mandate driven, the odds of me really being that, that useful to you, you know, you the HR professional or the CPG professional or that you know, senior engineer or that MBA finance controller person, you really do need to uh, research out that specific marketplace. Don't don't expect um, everybody to come come to you. You've got to do your own outbound research. And again, I'm I'm a fan of of of, uh, of, of working the numbers. So I'll, I'll I'll give you the same advice that I've given uh, friends and family, and that is that volume leads to quality. So if you 
are again looking to move to Portland or London or Abu Dhabi or Singapore, you're going to have to research out those markets. You're going to have to identify, I would say, probably 10 or more different recruiting companies um, and get some information into those companies, into the right person. I would do a follow-up phone call into those individuals as well, see if they received your information, and then I would just have a candid conversation you know, with respect to what they're working on and whether they think they can be uh, helpful to you in the near term. Um, so those would be some of the sort of the key ways to sort of work with recruiting companies. Um, you know, uh, I would not only focus, uh, I, I would say if you were a C-level individual, CEO, CFO, COO, I would say that a lot of the roles that you would uh, want to apply to, they, they could be handled by retained firms or contingent firms. I, I would think there would be somewhat some skew towards retained firms, though, for those opportunities. If you're more of a, a junior five-year person, I would say that, um, you know, five to ten-year people, I would say that um, two-thirds of the time, um, con contingency recruiting companies would probably handle those mandates. And again, I can't really generalize on who those companies are. I can't say that because you're an HR professional that Robert Half, um, is sort of the number one firm that you should talk to. Nor, nor can I say that if you're a CHRO, that Corn Ferry is the only recruiting company to talk to. You're really going to have to do your own research and reach out to folks and then sort of, sort of calibrate your sense of the market. Um, you know, the other question I would, that, that people have asked me is, um, you know, how should I manage my expectations? And, how often should I talk to um, recruiting professionals? And I would just say that um, if you, let's say for example, you are a, an HR professional, because again, um, there are recruiters who specialize in HR positions. I, I would tell you that um, if, if you're looking at, for example, HR positions in the Chicago area, you know, folks like uh, you know, Lancet, Crucial Hires as an example, um, handle a high volume of five to ten year level needs in the Chicago area. So he might, um, you know, he might have a, 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 lot, a lot of opportunities that he might be able to share with you. So you might find that you, you're going to talk to him more on a, on a bi-weekly basis as opposed to a monthly basis. So again, I think it, that's, a, that's, a, that's a little bit more of a, um, a question that to really kind of dig into with the HR, with the recruiting professional. I might tell you that um, I, I can't help you. Like you might say, um, John, I'd like to move to San Francisco in the renewable energy area. And I might say, I don't have anything active right now, but I'll definitely keep you in mind. I may also refer you to other competitors and friends of mine who are in the Bay Area who I think might be able to be more helpful because I think they might have a couple of active mandates that you might be interested in. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm open and, and interested to hear your questions as well. Um, I think the other thing here is um, th this is a little bit of a, a little bit of a, 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 a helpful hint from me. So, um, as a longtime recruiter, I can tell you that if you apply for a role that we have, um, you know, we've reached out to you, or you've you've applied through maybe an ad that we've run on behalf of a client, or um, you're just you're just soliciting me. Um, I will look online to um, see what other content there is about you, um, and you should view that as a positive. So what I mean by that is, let's say for example, um, you are um, COO of a company, and you um, have applied in for a role. Um, I'm going to look to see um, what kind of content you have out there on the web. So I'm going to look at your LinkedIn profile. Um, or any other profiles, uh, corporate profiles. Uh, I'm, if you have uh, art, uh, uh, video interviews, uh, or if you've given speeches at conferences, or if you have other thought leadership out there, I'm definitely going to check it out because uh, we love that sort of stuff. Our hiring contacts also do the exact same thing. So don't so so don't only look at 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 the, the third-party recruiting professional as somebody who looks at that stuff. My clients like Lisa Karp and HR for EDF, those individuals will also look at your content as well. So 
Um, if you have a, 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 an interesting LinkedIn profile, they're definitely going to check it out. Um, so does that mean you should link articles, um, videos, interviews, speeches, um, TV interviews where you've been interviewed by um, uh, by news and things like that? Should you link those to your LinkedIn or um, you know or, um, or or put those up on YouTube? Absolutely. Um, but again, we also look at everything. So um, I also tell you that. Um, if your Facebook is, is public and you have some stuff on there that's sort of fun, that's cool. If you have some stuff that's maybe uh, a bit unseemly for some of the roles that you're applying, I would just simply say, um, you know, you should be a little bit careful about what you, what you, what you share um, in, in, the, uh, in the public realm. So um, I, I'll just simply say that um, um, uh, content can also work against you. So something to think about. But um, uh, again, if, you're, if, you're, if you have an extensive background as a leader of a company uh, um, and you have some interesting content out there, it frankly adds. Um, the other thing I would also say is um, you know, a LinkedIn profile is another way to, to share out other content about your background that you may not want to put on your resume because you don't want your resume to be six pages. So um, if you want to highlight some other background or experiences on your LinkedIn profile, that's great. Another hint from me, um, actually, um, and this, this slide actually is perfect for this, I love, I love references. So if you have five, six, seven, eight references from clients, uh, colleagues, um, managers, uh, in your LinkedIn profile, I think that's great. I love those. I love to see um, the effort that somebody took on your behalf to give you um, a positive reference. Um, so I think the other Cliff notes here, Cliff's notes, would be you should also give references to to uh, to people who work for you as well because it it aids them in their own professional development and um, they're applying for other roles as well. So. Uh, again, we love this content. Uh, the more content, uh, the better. Uh, but but I'm not inviting you to be really ver verbose with what you share. Um, you know, going back to sort of the the content that you, that you send to recruiting companies, um, people have said, hey, should I send over my resume and should I send over articles that I've written uh, and and what what should I send? Papers I've written. And so what I've told people is cover letter, great. Um, focused cover letter, better. Uh, resume, absolutely. Articles that you've written, I don't think so. Um, I, I, I think it's better maybe if you, if you uh, indicate that you have um, some technical articles or other articles that you've written, or maybe if you can just link those. But at some point, it's probably, you're probably sharing too much information, um, more than, than, than I, I can probably handle and really get, dig into it, um, in that moment in time. Um, you know, another another thing you can also I'm going to shift gears a little bit. So let's let's talk about the relocation. So let's say, for example, you're in uh, New York and you want to move to Boston or you want to move to Chicago. So a question there is, if you're traveling out for interviews in Chicago or Boston, you're moving for personal reasons, blah blah blah. You're getting back here or whatever. Should you also try to meet with recruiting firm professionals? So let's say you've set up one interview with one company and it's in downtown Chicago um, with Bank of America. Should you also try to fill up your calendar and meet with some other individuals like say, for example, recruiting professionals? And the answer is yes. So um, again, if, if, um, if there, there are opportunities that, that we have on the books that, that would be relevant for you and you make it easier for us to, uh, to, to, to get with you and meet with you? Absolutely. Um, I've had, and I've got some people coming in, for example, uh, over uh, around Thanksgiving. So, you know, some individuals are, are interviewing uh, right before Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, an individual in particular also reached out and asked to have coffee. So we're going to do that. And this is an individual who um, is traveling in from San Francisco. So, it, it, frankly, it works. So... Uh, I, I think I think that if, if there's an overarching you know sort of point that I'm making is be proactive 
as opposed to reactive. So don't be passive. Um, you have to drive drive your search. So I'm discussing the recruiting firm piece, but I'm also digging into sort of your overall um, approach, which should be directly applying to companies that interest you. A lot of companies do um, uh, uh, list jobs on their own website as well as on websites like LinkedIn. Um, so you should apply directly to some of those companies. You should also directly network. You should also look at the, the postings that are on um, the web on a LinkedIn or you know some of those other big websites. Um, you know one thing one thing to keep in mind um, the the recruiting professional who is handling those postings for companies they're not always your advocate when it comes to helping you um, shift into an industry. So um, again, sometimes those postings are uh, a little tougher to crack because quite frankly, um, the person who is um, receiving your background with that solar company um, is just trying to score your background. And if you check six of their eight boxes, they might give you a score of 70 or 80 or whatever that is. And so they may not preference you for, for an opportunity. So again, you, you sort of want to manage your expectations as you as you try to do everything. So, you know, LinkedIn, um, you know, job post job postings, uh, recruiting companies. And getting back to recruiting companies, uh, again, we also can be great sources of, of, of advice as well. So, you know, if, if you're in the power sector, uh, more often than not, I like to hear from people if you're you know, working in power, renewable energy, uh, energy storage, uh, electric vehicle, mobility, uh, the sort of uh, modern technology. I like to generally talk to people. Um, I don't work in consumer products, so if you try to to get me on the phone and talk about this stuff, I might be very quickly to get off the phone, and I might say, hey, I got your email. Uh, I'll email you back with three other folks, frankly, who I think are uh, much more connected in your space. And I don't think I'm your person, so I'll send you over to so and so, and another person, and another person. Um, so um, again, just just I would just be sort of mindful of of sort of what uh, you might be getting getting from me. So I think the the, the rule of thumb is the more specialized a recruiter is by uh, by by industry, um, the the less likely we we'll, we can help you sort of generally um, with the marketplace. Um, so just uh, th those would be some sort of general, fast, quick comments about us. So as an example, if you're, um, I have a, a really good friend, Julian Ha, who is a recruiter in the DC area, and he uh, does nothing but work in the nonprofits sector. So again, he's an example that specialty is a thing. So Julian does nothing but 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 handle uh, leadership positions with with nonprofits and trade associations and things like that. So again, that means that John Ryan does not handle um, nonprofits and, and companies like that, but in fact, Julian does. So again, the, the, the note there is we're highly specialized um, and um, we might uh, slice that market very thinly. Now, that's the case in the United States. And I'm gonna shift gears here again. Now, if you're international um, or you're applying to international positions, this can be less so. So, as an example, and this might be, well, for example, I, I, I don't know that I don't know the total population of, say, um, you know, of Peru. But as an example, it, in some countries like Finland, the total population of Finland is something like um, six million people, and now I'm waiting for somebody to actually correct me with a response in. But you know, in some of these other um, countries, as an example, the actual total population is much, much smaller than it is in the US, which is you know, somewhere around 290 million people. So that being the case, if you're in an international market like, say, Peru or Finland or Sweden or, somebody, or someplace like that, that market's a lot smaller. So you might find that um, recruiting professionals are more general than I am in the United States, where, again, we're almost at 300 million people. 
So one generalization that you can sort of take from this from this webinar is that um, in the U.S. we can be very specialized in much smaller markets. Again, like um, in much smaller countries, uh, you might find that recruiting professionals are far less specialized. So you might find that a recruiting professional in in Peru, like Jorge Villachaga in my company, Trend Search Peru, he might be working with power companies and consumer product companies and automotive companies, and the list goes on and on and on. So you might find that he handles um, eight, eight industries where I might only handle three of those. Um, so that would be another thing to also keep in mind as well. Now, are, there are some pretty big markets out there. So I would just, I'll just note that some of the, some of the, uh, the bigger countries, um, you know, with bigger populations um, have probably more specialization. I would say that the United States, I would say, um, I would say the UK, I would say France, Germany, China, India are some markets where you might see a high level of specialization, just given uh, this, again, just the sheer size of the, of those, of the populations in some of those countries. You know, in contrast, you might find that in Japan, even though Japan has a, a, a high population, you might find that it might be more general because the market is still smaller. Or if you go specifically uh, in some place like Thailand, you might find that uh, it's a much smaller number of recruiting companies as well. So, okay, so, so what are we learning from John? <laughs> we're, learning, we're learning a couple of things here. Um, recruiting firms are super specialized by sector, by job function, um, and um, they're probably less specialized in much smaller regions. So John is telling you that you should do a lot of your own research online. Um, one of the things that was somebody asked me the other day was whether there was a great resource, like a master book of recruiting firms. You know, and, the, and I really can't find one right now. Every, all the links that I looked at for this webinar um, were all hosted by, by a recruiting company, so they were all biased. They were all um, low infomercial, so I can't really recommend those. In the past, there was the uh, Kennedy publication. Um, Kennedy publications used to have this thing called the Red Book, and it was, the, it was, the, uh, it was a compendium of all the recruiting firms um, in, in the world. Um, but they don't seem to be putting that out anymore. I think the, the most recent one that I saw was from 2011. But, you know, the good news is the Internet's awesome. You're awesome. You should be able to figure this out yourself. So if you go online and you start typing in um, Austin, Texas recruiting firms, you should get a number of hits. When you look at these hits, um, again, you need, to, uh, you need to go to these websites, start sifting through the information. And my own, um, my own personal suggestion when you're, say, focusing on a geographic market is I would start with lots of specific search terms in the beginning, like probably seven or eight, like a Boolean string. And then I would start to limit that down if you're not liking how, uh, how few hits you're getting. So, for example, if you, if you type in Austin, Texas search firm, you're going to get um, six or seven pages of hits. So... You might want to then narrow that down and say, put in Austin, Texas, um, FinTech. Now the list might be uh, much more focused, much more on point, and you'll get two pages of, of hits. Um, and it, again, if you look at any of these markets, that's pretty much what's going to happen with, with all of these, all these regional markets. Or because if you, if you just type in human resources recruiting companies in, in your web browser, you're going to get so many hits, it's almost not even relevant. So in my opinion, you, you, should, you should try to initially go specific and then, and then go more broad. So again, um, again let's say you're um, you know, looking for opportunities in you know, Los Angeles. I would type in Los Angeles recruiting firms fintech or consumer products or solar energy. Um, or nonprofit, and then I would look at the hits. Um, I, again, I think we all know that better websites tend to uh, 
that are more SEO optimized, uh, SEO optimized tend to be uh, tend to show up on the first or second page. So you you should go beyond the first and second page of of your, of your search results because um, you know some of the uh, other good search firms might be on the third, fourth, and fifth page. But again, I would I would just start to to look at the the, the hits and if you see a list of 30 recruiting companies, um, you may decide um, as a result that um, you're going to start to uh, to to reach out and email um, you know various specific recruiters at these companies. You're going to hit Todd Jones at Corn Ferry, Los Angeles. You're going to hit Julian Ha at Spencer Stewart. You're going to hit Julian um, Smithers at uh, Stanton Chase, John Ryan at Transearch. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to to ping you know ten or or even more more folks than that, um, because some of us will again come back and let you know that um, you know we don't handle exactly what you're looking for, and we'll make um, may, we'll we'll refer you to another colleague in, in in our company, or we'll suggest people outside of our company. Um, hopefully, we'll get back to you. Uh, hopefully. Most most people in recruiting are try to be helpful and respond to all our emails, um, but you know you, you can also kind of game that system a little bit. So again, when you send when you send an info packet to 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 any of us, um, what I what I what I really want you to do though is I want you to I want you to share some information that makes makes me understand what you want to do. So if your background is again all consumer products, but you want to make an industry change, and you happen to think that I, um, you know, handle nothing but um, HR positions in the Chicago area, you should note, you should, you should indicate that that's why you're contacting me, and that you're wondering if that's the case and whether we can follow up. Uh, I think more, the more tailored and more customized your your email to me, the more the more more likely I um, will prioritize getting back to you. Um, it is the case that um, you know my email blows up every every day and Monday is insane. So uh, I do try to get back to people as much as I can. Um, so are there any other things you can do with respect to recruiting firms? So research, contacting specific individuals, contacting individuals um, who are either in your industry or in your target location. Again, if you're looking to, to relocate to a specific city or country. Um, is there anything else you can do to, to, to engage us? Again, um, you can also, um, in your cover letter, um, you could, if you have, um, if you have some, uh, some YouTube video content that you think really um, uh, shows shows you well in terms of your ability to be interviewed by Bloomberg or an industry news publication or by CNN or something like that. If you have this killer CNN interview, um, <laughs> you know, or you're on Think Tank or something, send me the link. Um, I will look at it. Uh, it's that's great stuff. You know, uh, don't hide that. You know, so it's an opportunity to uh, to really impact uh, your people with your outreach. And frankly. The information packet that you send me is not that dissimilar to one that you might send to an industry contact or when you're applying for roles or to even just other LinkedIn contacts. Um, we, we all kind of want the same thing. You know, we all want to sort of uh, uh, hear, all, hear all the great things about your background, your experience, and your potential, et cetera. Um, so that would be some of the things that, uh, that I, would, I would suggest. I don't know, uh, Linda, if there are any questions that people have. Um, there are. Thank you so much for these wonderful questions and, and all of that helpful information, uh, John. We have a question about um, recruiters that might contact you on LinkedIn. Are these safe? Are they worth worthwhile connections? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let's go. Let's go with innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> How do you like that one, Linda? I think. <laughs> Yeah. Very yeah. I mean, I mean, if if um, if I or um, uh, another recruiting professional reaches out to somebody via LinkedIn um, to connect or just to share a position, I would definitely follow up. Um, recruiters, both internal and external. I'm external. Internal would be somebody who works at Craft. Um, will directly reach out to people on LinkedIn. Um, 
that's the whole point of of, of LinkedIn as a uh, a business focused social networking site. Um, so you should re you should look at them now. Um, when I reach out to folks, like to, for example, to connect on LinkedIn, I frequently will see that they viewed my profile. So I've I've done what I can to uh, to make my profile strong and interesting. I've I've tried to pack in good content. Um, I I also have um, I think you know around twelve client uh, recommendations. Again, I think that looks pretty good if you can if you can have some pretty good in, uh, recommendations. Um, more cred for 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 managers as opposed to peers um, as well. So, so the answer is yes, you should do that um, unless you uh, have concerns about um, you know uh, that individual because they don't only really have a, a very detailed profile. Somebody tried to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn today, and their profile their profile literally was only in their their name. So that seemed a little bit scary. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, how do you maintain a good relationship with a recruiter from a recruiting company? For instance, this individual was recently talking to a recruiter and the recruiter wanted to move faster where the applicant was not perhaps ready for interviews quite yet. Uh, a couple things there. Um, I mean, if, if, that in, if, you're, if you don't want to move as fast as the opportunity is moving, I guess it's just not going to work. Um, so you'll just have to keep in touch regarding other opportunities. Um, I, I would wonder why that individual, um, you know, um, uh, doesn't want to uh, sort of follow up on opportunities here and now. I would just tell you right now, if, if you're getting contacted by um, recruiting professionals, internal, external, about an opportunity that really checks a lot of your boxes, you should just go ahead and look at it now if you're even, uh, even passively interested in opportunities because um, opportunities that really check all of your boxes don't come around on a regular basis. So you probably owe it to yourself to uh, take a, a hard look at it. Another way to sort of ingratiate yourself with search people, let's say, for example, that you, you, um, somebody's called to network with you on something, and you're like, oh, cool, that's a great opportunity, but yeah, um, yeah I can't move to Seattle. Um, you know, um, I, can't move, I can't move from San Francisco. Thanks for reaching out. One way to really connect with us is give us referrals. If you know somebody who you think might be of interest, um, give us referrals. Um, you get you get a couple of gold stars for that. Anyway, other questions? Yeah, we have a couple follow-up questions to that idea. When a recruiter tells you, um, you know, I'll, I'll keep you on my radar, what does that mean, and how can you stay top of mind? So, you know. Uh, Top of my radar can mean a couple of things. It's super vague, obviously. So, um, and it's you know, uh, you know, you know, it's it's vague by design. Um, so that if, when I hear people say things like that, I'll keep you on my radar. That means I'm actively going to keep you in mind for opportunities. So it is the case that let's say, for example, um, if I was functionally specialized, again, I'll use the example of HR in Chicago. So if if I'm keeping you in mind. If I if I only handle HR positions in the Chicago area, um, it makes more sense for me to preference people who are actively looking as opposed to people who really aren't looking. Um, so if if you're in that active file, I will keep you in mind or at the top of the stack or on my radar screen. Um, but it can also mean that the person doesn't really have a lot of active mandates that really line up with your your background as well. If it's more the latter, and I would probe that, if it's if it's if that's their polite way of saying I don't have anything for you right now, you may you may want to just reach out to more recruiting um, people because maybe that maybe um, again uh, maybe maybe you just need to to just you know add more people into your your pipeline. Other what questions? are specific things that would turn you off as a recruiter from a candidate? Pet peeves of sorts. Uh, but you know, one of my personal pet peeves are, are people who talk too much and don't know how to maintain a conversation. So um, if if you uh, if you interrupt me like crazy, um, it's annoying. So uh, again, hopefully with most people, I, I only experience this around like once a week with people. Most most people most professionals, you guys are awesome, um, are pretty good at at having a conversation. I talk, you talk, and we we go back and forth. But again, if we if we have questions, um, just make sure. That, please don't cut us off if we're trying to go through some 
uh, some sort of general information background questions because we have to ask these questions so we can add you to the database or evaluate your background. Pet peeves for me would be, um, you know, again, uh, you know, try to answer the question, you know, get, get to the point. Um, if I ask you about location, um, you know, let's say, for example, you reach out and go, John, you know, um, you know I'm really interested in, and I, I work in power, uh, in renewable energy, I'm a, I'm a wind person, uh, I'm interested in opportunities, oh, great, I'm surprised we've never talked before, um, interested in opportunities all over the country, um, well, you know, blah, 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 I'm like, okay, so what is, what, what are you saying, no? But, um, so, I, I, again, I would just be very specific if, if, if people are asking you specific questions. Um, if you're really, really interested in your location and you'll, you'll go anywhere, say that. If, if you literally hate Houston and you never want to look at opportunities in Houston and you're an oil and gas person, I'd say, oh, okay, all right, okay. And I'll just keep asking you questions. So, uh, again, just be, be clear and, and straightforward. Again, I'm not really going to ask. I'm going to ask you for your, your, your compensation expectations. I'm not going to ask you what you make anymore. So that's, that's a question that was sort of sticky with people. Um, I may ask you about why you're looking, um, and I'm, I'm not looking for the dirty laundry about how much you hate your boss and you have the worst boss um, ever in the history of, of, of corporate America. I'm really more looking to find out what, what you're really going after. And if you're, if you're looking for a better challenge and you're bored, hey, that works for me. I don't know. Other questions? Um, we have a comment saying from an individual saying that they notice or they seem to notice that recruiters are mostly connected to smaller boutique companies. Do recruiters also recruit for larger companies? What is your experience on that? So that's that's not true, um, actually. Um, th that's an interesting generalization, but I would say that's not. Tr I would not say that that's true. So, the, because then the question would be, would 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 recruiters like myself, tend to skew heavy towards working with privately held companies or publicly held companies. And when I think about the companies I've worked with on an industry specialization basis, they've been both. And sometimes they've been more public and sometimes they've been more private. So I think it really depends. I mean, it may seem like, it may, it may be the case that some, some recruiters maybe tend for some reason or another work with smaller or privately held companies. But I don't think that's always the case. I think there's always a story there. Um, you know, I, now well, that being said, I can I can I can dig holes in that. So it is the case that Kraft, right? So let's take food companies. It is the case that Kraft has much greater brand recognition. So Kraft can can put jobs on their website and jobs on LinkedIn, and they might come up more often in searches. So it is the case that that big Fortune 100 companies like Kraft, McDonald's. Uh, Boeing, et cetera, it may be the case that a lot they may they may advertise more positions um, because they have um, more people searching on them. So, as a, in stark contrast, a an Italian pasta company because I have a client like that, um, but a Rana Rana as an example, a fresh pasta company. Many of you have may, may have never heard of them, even though it's a six hundred million dollar company, but they make fresh pasta that you can buy at Mariano's and Jewel and, you know, Wegmans and these various grocery stores, Costco. Um, so it might be the case that Arana might use a recruiting company because they might not have um, as much um, impact advertising position. So it, it might be the case that some of the less well-known companies might do that. But uh, all, all those things are true. And um, most of the big public companies for CXO positions will oftentimes use recruiting companies, um, you know, for positions. Thank you so much. Uh, we I want to be mindful of time, um, so we're going to have to end questions at this point. But thank you to everybody who wrote in. You had some really insightful questions, and thank you, John, for for answering those, giving us a peek into the, the inside mind of a of a recruiter. We Thanks. do have career programming for the rest of this November. So please check out online at careers.uchicagoalumni.org for more. You can join us tomorrow at the same time for a webinar entitled How to Build an Inclusive Workplace that Fosters Equity and Diversity. Thank you again, John, and please everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.